your goals should be around your process. What process mm -hmm. can I build that has positive expected value that I could do day after day after day and even in a rough patch, which if you do this long enough, even when you lose money, it's not a rough patch. It is what it is. Welcome back, everybody, to Be The Trader. Today, I, br I am bringing back a guest who's been on the show before. He's an author, trader, Michael Martin. Welcome back, my man. He's the author, just in case you're like, wait, author of what? The Inner Voice of Trading, which you can actually check it out going to his, his website, martinchronicle.com, and you can go check that out. I highly recommend that because he gives it away for free. So it's awesome. But welcome back, my man. Thank you so much for having me. It's very nice to be here. The audiobook version's for free. Yeah, I figure, man, the more I can do to help people, just, you know, we're all in this fight together. You know, we all feel the same feelings. I think the difference between folks that make it for, you know, three, four decades like me, or even the folks who mentored me who are in 50, 60 years of experience, it's not that they are catatonic, like out of a scene of awakenings where they're just kind of there. They're very emotional people. They just don't let their emotions affect their judgment hmm. and subvert what it is they're trying to do in their risk management. So the audiobook version's for free. There's no gimmicks. It's just there. Just tell me where to send it to you. You download it and you download the files. It's about, I think it's like 500 megabytes of total data. So probably not something you want to do OTA or on your smartphone, although you can. Um, but yeah. It's for yeah, free. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. But just everyone, so that way you guys know, this is not going to be your typical type of interview. This is more of like a fireside chat. We're just going to catch up, and there's going to be tidbits here and there. And you already started off, Martin, by uh, Michael, by basically saying that everyone's not like, they're not robots. You know, they don't just yeah. not have emotions. And it's funny hearing from you because from my perspective, you know, I've only been trading for four years. And yeah. while I'm trading, I still get emotions constantly. Yeah. And it's like what I'm starting to realize is like the more and more I can recognize those emotions, sometimes yeah. I'll like feel a trigger and I'll have to go get, leave this room, go to the bathroom, do a couple of breathes, like breathe in, breathe out, like walk around the house before I come back and place a trade. Because if I don't, I might be in the wrong mindset. So it's cool that you said that because you, I mean, you've been talking to traders who've been trading for freaking ever, you know, <laughs> like yeah. ever. It's crazy. I'm very lucky, man. I mean, I'm just lucky to think of where I came from in like upstate New York is about an hour north of Manhattan and about 20 minutes west of Danbury, Connecticut, you know, from a working class family to, you know, finding my way to all these really legendary guys who took me under their wing. So when you see someone like that, um, I don't want to say under duress, but, you know, when you know things are working against them as as it happens and they don't freak out you learn a certain type of behavior, like everyone gets whipsawed. I mean, just the other last week or so, or, you know, I don't know when this will go live, but the government was talking about raising rates or what have you, and a lot of the financials got whips, whipped, uh, got crushed that day. There was some three, four, 5% moves in a day. You know, I got stopped on a bunch of stuff. And of course, a few of them have rebounded and have gone back up to above where I had gotten stopped. And it's like, do you think I'm immune from that? It doesn't, it happens. Um, too many people and, are always and to your like, earlier point. It's ahead. like now I expect that. I really expect if you look at like a normal distribution of what can possibly happen to you when you're in a trade, you can get in and get knocked out the same day. You can get in and keep it. And that just becomes your one and only risk unit. A smaller portion of them will keep going up. So you can add your second, third, your fourth risk unit. And some of them just take off and go parabolic. Then there's Raven Industries, which, you know, you get in RAVN is the ticker. I don't have a position now, but you could see it kind of broke out. It stalled. It sold off. Most longs were stopped. And then they announce a big takeover or something and you move and, you know, you miss it. And it's just like, that's the way it goes. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. I, I wasn't in the trade myself at that point, but, uh, you know, I'm happy for whoever made money on it. No one's immune from that stuff. Doesn't matter whether you're in market wizards or not, or whether you, no one knows who you are, but you're making a thousand percent a year. I mean, it's just, it happens and you have to live with it. The one thing that I did cleverly when I was younger was if I had that moment that you described moments ago, I might take the rest of the day off. I don't want to come back to the desk when I was much more active. Now I move at a snail's pace. I don't like I'm not sitting here double clicking my mouse all day. Um, I might take the rest of the day off. And if I'm down, you know, for the week, 
I might, I'm not going to try to scrap like Wednesday's close or Thursday's open. If I'm frustrated and I'm down, I might just say, Hey man, I'm going to take a few days off. I'm going to go golfing, going to go to beach, going to go on a hike, going to go to yoga class, going to go play guitar. I'll come back Monday with a fresh head. And that meant the world, the difference. Mm. So many people get saying like, well, if I'm not at my desk and I'm not grinding, if I'm not doing this David Goggins bullshit, like you end up hurting yourself more than helping yourself. I think it's because we come from working class. Like you said earlier, you came from the working uh class. So you know that, I mean, the David, I like David Goggins, but I think what you mean by bull is the fact that that doesn't work in training at all. Like if you push, 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 you work hard, hard, like in a working class life, it can work for you, right? Like you can, you can get noticed. You might get promoted. You might make more money, you know, but eventually and if you take that trading. Yeah. So, yeah, for the record, his book is, is, is one of the best audio books I listened to. You know, uh, his story is quite remarkable, especially, when, you know, we talked about his father. And so I'm aware of that whole I'm going to I'm a seal. I'm a ranger. And now I'm in business. Uh, Jocko's Willick is an hour away south of me. Um, but you're right. If you're going to you can't bull your way through trading. It's much more about surrender right? Surrender so that you can come back with a fresh head. It works if you're going to do, you know, uh, bad water and, and run these ultra marathons. For sure, you have to dig inward. And I do think it does speak to persistence and determination. But sometimes, well, all the time in risk management, persistence and determination also means when do you take a reprieve for yourself? Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean you're weak. It doesn't mean that you're less than. It doesn't mean, you know, so much of this business, especially I, first recommendation, since you're going to ask me this later, is to get off Twitter. Get off Twitter, get off any of the social media stuff, because there's so much peacocking and bravado um, about stock picks and returns. And it's like, it's so not about that. If someone's selling you returns, man, you they've got the hook set. And, you know, you can make enormous returns for sure. But you have to remember, if you're talking anything over 100 percent, you're largely thinking about massive amounts of leverage. And I wouldn't recommend that for people who, who are just starting out because they don't have a sense of, of where the tide is. They need to mm-hmm. kind of figure out what's going to work first. So I think all of this kind of ties into the macho part of trading, which I have no use for. I think it's a wasted emotion. Uh, it's usually for people who actually feel insecure, in my humble opinion, that they constantly have to push that kind of energy out there. It's a real turnoff for me. And I don't really even return those emails. So, you know, it's, it's, it goes under the chapter of self-knowledge is more important than what you know, in my opinion. If you don't know who you are, then what you know doesn't really matter. Mm. You know, it's funny you say that because I, so many times, like, I mean, I sucked at trading forever, like forever. So did I. And, and, so did and I. I can tell you that as I slowly started to get better, you know, some of the trader friends I had got better, some just disappeared. And what I've noticed is like, we all trade, man, everyone trades completely different. And then yeah. I'm starting to know more and more since I've been consistent for oh, man, only a year and a half now. But like yeah. what I've recognized is it's about controlling me, like not controlling, that's the wrong word, but more about understanding me, like you said, mm-hmm. and understanding what my strengths are, my weaknesses are, and understanding my emotions and I'm trading me. Like I'm not trading a chart. I know it sounds weird. I'm not trading a chart. I'm really trading myself because we could trade the exact same ticker and ha- and trade it completely differently and both be right or both yeah. be wrong, but mm-hmm. trade it completely opposite, short, long. And it amazes me how many days I talked to one of my buddies named Scott. He's a trader for about 30 years. Um, he's been on the show before too. If you're curious who he is, go check him out. But I'll talk to him like every day and he'll be like, Hey, I was short this ticker. And I was like, I was long and we both did yeah. well. And it just blows my mind how important it is. I'm starting to see more and more that it's yeah. right here. It's right here. No, I, I totally, un- I agree with you hundred percent. Your, your trading ethos is going to be as unique to you as your fingerprints are uh, and mine too. And there's, there's just a million ways to skin that cat, so to speak. So I feel like, you know, you're onto a good point here is that you don't have to be like anybody else. Um, I, I, and, and two, you know, in terms of appropriateness for risk, you know, it's probably important to set goals, but 
for me, the, the goal is not necessarily a target return. It might be the case if you're dealing with endowments and foundations and that kind of stuff, because they have investment policy statements and spending policy statements, and they do need their money to grow at a certain pace because that money helps them offset certain costs and allows them to make certain other capital investments in their overall infrastructure. So that that's a different deal. But if you're a trader, though, working for yourself, your goal should be around your process. What process can I build that has positive expected value that I could do day after day after day and even in a rough patch, which if you do this long enough, even when you lose money, it's not a rough patch. It is what it is. When you trade pro as a pro, losses are part of the business. If you don't like look at the look at the the commodities markets a couple of weeks back gave a real good lesson in proctology because they got smashed for like 10 10 percent in a day. I mean, you had range almost limit moves in many of them. And I can remember Ed saying like, look, if you don't like whipsaws, you can always stop trading. Hmm. You know, it does. No one's immune from that. You know, I think people get caught up in that. They, they get so mad at themselves. Cause I used to, I, I mean, that's, I used to beat myself up all the time. Like, Oh, I just got stopped out. I'm an idiot. It just reversed. And mm -hmm. I've realized that if I'm going to do this forever, yeah, I want to be happy and not be miserable, you know, like, cause it's training, like you're going to take losses. Like, do you want to be miserable every day or do you want to be happy that you're doing something you love? Mm -hmm. And I chose to be happy. And, and yeah. cause if you don't, then when you make money, you'll still be unhappy because you'll be like, oh, I could have made more. I should have cut it sooner and save more profits. Like it's it's a big losing cycle if you stay in that wrong mindset. 100%. I feel like sooner or later, you just come to the point where like you put your trades on based on your rules mm -hmm. and the results, you're powerless over the results in the short run, right? So you make money, you lose money. You pretty much have to be non to or non placated, I guess is a better word, regardless of the outcome. Because really what you want to get addicted to is following your process. Mm. The results, you know, it's, it's the, the data in the short run are too random, you know, to think that you're onto something, unless, of course, you're going to program a computer to start moving things super quick. But you also have to conjugate that with the quality mm -hmm. of life. Like, I'm not at a stage where I want to sit in front of a screen all day anymore. When I was younger, I was tied into that energy, which is a younger guy kind of, like, again, I think it's a macho energy. I don't care what you call yourself. I don't care what kind of trader you are. I realize, you know, over living through all this, you know, decades and decades is that, you know, life is life is just super short. We don't have as much time on planet Earth as we think. And so I want to completely measure, you know, where's my effort going and what's going on in my overall life. I don't want trading to be my life. You mm -hmm. know, that's not the case. My life, you know, trading's part of it. Managing risk is part of it but I'm not going to have it become all consuming in that I have to be at the desk from say five in the morning, local time to, you know, through the closing bell. And then a couple of hours after it just, that's not a high quality of life for me. Yeah, no, I agree. I, you know, you said something earlier too, that I know people are going to be scratching their head about this. Cause you were like, yeah, you know, at Sakota, I met, you know, I've been, you know, fortunate to meet these traders, but then you also said, and we both said that, everyone's trades their own way. There's so many ways to skin a cat, if you will. Yeah. And so people are like, well, how do I learn then? Right. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think what I, I think looking back, I think it's okay to like maybe talk to someone and get ideas, but I think the way you learn is just, you let me know what your thoughts are, but I think it's more of like maybe see completed trades. Maybe if you have that ability, you know, maybe if you have the ability to talk to someone, you see at them at the end of the day and then kind of review and figure it out, kind of like reverse engineering, because if yeah. you reverse engineer, then you can kind of build your own process. Because right. if you just take what they tell you, which I did at first, mm -hmm. and you try to apply it for you, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work that way. Like you got to like try new things and, and be willing to lose every day. Till you figure out what works for you. Yeah. I mean, the best teacher is experience, right? So if someone's sitting there with some money, there's no, it's like having, you know, get married, start having kids. You're never going to be a hundred percent ready to have kids. You just have to get into the process of doing it. Um, trading to me too, is like, if you want to start trading, then just start trading. Mm. There's no 
course that you have to take. There's no anything because sooner or later, you know, you have to do it with real money because that's when your emotional system gets, you know, kicked in. And we all have that. Even if you run a system, you still have an emotional system. Um, there's the one that you're conscious of. And then there's the subconscious part. That's why we always look at ritual versus routine. Cause a lot of things you might be doing during your day that feel really, really good, but they don't mean anything towards your PL. Hmm. And the last thing you want to do is be spending that, that brain power on stuff that doesn't matter, you know, and do, do mindless activities. So we're just hyper aware of everything that we do. We took a look at the time blocking. We look at what are productive activities, non-productive activities. And then we look at how do you bridge the knowing doing gap for everybody. You know, if you were like me, I got a thousand trading books. I have original versions of everything, you know, cause they were like, that's how I, I wanted to get the wisdom. Hmm comes from the experience there's no book that you can really read you can read quotes and there's lots of guys who pump out quotes from trading there's no emotional attachment to it really until you can incorporate it into your behavior the way i like to say it is thoughts feelings actions what do you think you want trading to do for you what's the purpose why do you get up and do it every day mm. like what is how does the how does the process of trading serve you and then what do you think the money's going to mean to you if you're lucky enough to make the money over decades and decades? What do you want it to do? You want to set up a foundation? You want to give it away? You want to buy expensive artwork? You want to, you know, just have ample cash around to pay for your kid's education, save for your own retirement, and then maybe help at least one or maybe two sets of parents, right? Uh, I just want the independence or the flexibility to do what I want. I want the liberty. I want the autonomy. So I think the more people can actually think about what it is that they want the whole process to do for them, they can be much more uh, attuned to who they are as human beings mm -hmm. and set those types of goals, not around returns, but around their behavior, because it's behavior that predicts where you end up in life. Mm -hmm. nice. So for me, it's like get off social media. The second step is turn off the television. Because if you need that as, an, as a crutch or I'm in this name and it's supposed to do something, and I'm in the trade and I'm down a little bit or I'm up a little bit, but I'm waiting for other people to do things. Mm. That's not a trading strategy. You know, you, you have to be completely independent and do things because of what you think and what you feel and make sure that your emotional system, especially the one that's in your subconscious, which we all have, doesn't subvert your, your, what it is that you think you want to do intellectually. And that's where you can have a divergence is like you read books. And so, you know, all this intellectual stuff, how many PhDs that, you know, are struggling financially, virtually all of them, you know what I mean? So, that, so, so in if it was about intelligence, everybody would be Paul Tudor Jones. Mm. You know what I mean? Yep. I think, I think, um, and even Ray Dalio, Ray Dalio wrote a book. I think it's called principles. It didn't stop him from having duress in his own life, including people at Bridgewater who, you know, took him on in the media or might've even gotten involved with him legally. Like no one's immune from this stuff, despite their intellectual and philosophical. Everyone wants to be a philosopher. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Taleb, Soros, Ray Dalio, they all want to be Karl Popper or somebody. <laughs> it's like, listen, just trade, just trade. You know, <laughs> it's, because we, it's like it's like we have this impression that we think eventually we will be that stoic trader with no emotions. But I think you've already shown blatantly clear from the relationships you have, from your own experience, that mm. it never goes away. Right. It's always going to be there. And so like you need to see this right now for listening. Like Michael's been trading or been in the markets a lot longer than a lot of people. And so if you think you're going to eventually be like, oh, once I. Once I get rid of this emotion, I'm going to be good. You might want to pump the brakes and, and check yeah. yourself for a moment. But what do you think? Because I know people still want to, because they hear you, you meet a lot of people, right? You meet, you, you've known a lot of well, well-known traders. Yeah. And you build relationships with people like that. Uh -huh. any, any idea or any recommendations you can give people who may be trying to reach out to, maybe it's you, maybe it's an a future Ed Sakota or, or another trader, but they can't get their attention. Like, how would you recommend someone talk to another trader to potentially get a mentor unofficially? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the marketing part is always the gun, but no one wants to go get the bullets, right? I want to run $10 million, but I'm afraid to pick up the phone and ask rich people for business. Like you can see, and I've mentioned that on my own show is that someone's got to do the marketing. Um, you know, it's really hard. You know, this business is, is hard if you want to be a pro. 
I don't think it's hard if you want to get pro results for your own money, but if you want to go pro, the, the, the hurdles that you have to jump now, they were hard for me and now the numbers are bigger. Uh, and it's very, very difficult because the people that allocate are probably going to find you. Um, typically, you would reach out to an unknown allocator, or some kind of global macro outfit, and they're going to ask for your actual returns, probably your risk disclosure document. We'll talk to us about your process. Happen. It's not like a first date where you're hitting it off. You buy someone a drink, you exchange phone numbers, and you ask them out, and then there's a date. Nuh uh there's months, maybe years that go by where you're sending like your trade signals every day. And mm -hmm. you're like, well, wait a minute. I'm, I'm opening up the kimono here. I'm sending my trade signals to this outfit and I don't have any money. I'm revealing myself to them. Everyone thinks they could reverse engineer and steal it. They're not so not concerned about your trading model from stealing it. They don't care. They already have really good people working for them who are making the money. So they're not going to try to steal a model from a nobody and mm -hmm. make it their own. So you can let go of the paranoia of that. And that's the way the business is done. If you're not comfortable with that, then you don't have to do it. But if you don't do it, I guarantee you with 100% certainty, you're not getting any allocation. So you have to be on their radar. Maybe they want to see monthly returns, but they also want to see trade signals. And what they're really looking for is how do you fit in with their stable of existing horses, so to speak? Because mm. they're you, thinking of it, they're thinking of you, the manager, as being part of their portfolio. So how do we add you into the portfolio and your style of trading? And what does that do to our daily vol? Mm. In today's age, they're looking for low vol. They're not looking for you know, if they're looking for one or 200 basis point days, that's, that's not what they're looking for. That's retail, fast money, you know, kind of stuff. But the allocators aren't looking for that because they're saying, huh, in order for that to happen a lot, one of two things are happening. One is you're using excessive leverage, which is going to put us at risk. We don't want that. So thank you anyway. Or two, you were lucky and you were in the right place at the right time. And that's not really a strategy, right? Mm, yeah. You bought Google at 80 bucks when they did the auction, you held on so you can claim to have XYZ rates of return over 25 years or whatever, but you didn't really trade. You bought a name, you got lucky, you held it, it went up, no no hard feelings. Same thing with any of the cryptos, although they've pulled back. Yeah. Um, I think you wanna focus on being authentic. Speak to people like a human being. Um, if you try to put on airs and start quoting people and starting coming on like you're a fanboy or like you're in love with Jennifer Aniston and you run into her coming out of a restaurant, that can be off-putting. But if you just be your authentic self, hey, it's nice to meet you. I've read your work. I've been inspired by what you were able to accomplish. I'm kind of in a similar path. You know, just be a human being because at mm. the end of the day, they deal with the same thing. They're married, they're divorced, their kids are in trouble. You know, they... You know, they are they have political things that that they're excited or, or bugged about. They, you know, they're just regular people at the end of the day. Yeah. That um, makes sense. Some, some of them admittedly were way ahead of their time. You know, the commodity corporation guys were way, way ahead of their time. And I don't know that I haven't seen anything since they were way, way, way ahead of their time. Um, quite a remarkable group of guys. Um, you know, and, and, and that's that's good fortune. That's being in the right place at the right time. Um, two, three, you know, not everything that you plan out goes as planned and you have to pivot. Case in point, Commodities Corporation. They felt that if they had a bunch of PhDs that they'd have superior information on various types of commodities. So they raised a couple million bucks. I think it was a million from Nestle and then a million from you know, another private investor, Harvard professor, his name's escaping me now, but it's not, in, it's not important. And I think they drew the capital down 50%. Like they were almost at it. They lost 900 K of 2 oh million and they were at almost at a puke point. And this is going back to like early, early 1970s. Oh, so that was like a lot of money. I mean, compared to now. Oh, it's an enormous sum of capital, especially for an individual. In, for Nestle, I think the deal was, is that you're going to let you run the money in and around everything that we need. Cause Nestle as a producer, excuse me, of, of cookies and pastas and breads, they're users of commodities and users of commodities are buying hedges. 
Whereas if I'm Farmer Brown and I got a field full of soybeans, I need to sell futures to hedge because I'm long the physical. So I want to sell futures to create the hedge. I'm long and short. Users are inherently short the physical that they need to make, you know, their cookies, chips, ahoy, whatever. So, so they have to buy futures to hedge and that puts mm -hmm. them on the same side of lots of speculators. So I think the deal was, is we'll give you the money, but we also want your research. What, what's the whole, I don't understand this part now because the whole, the hedge idea, right? Like mm. if you're hedging, then are you just pretty much, you have like, it's like, I don't know what the hell is going to happen. So I'm, I'm long, I'm short. So at some point I got to get rid of one so I can actually make money. You know what I'm saying? Like, so like, doesn't, mm -hmm. isn't like a really difficult situation to constantly just not make anything happen, just constantly tread water or break even, or, you know what I'm saying? It kind of, makes me think that way when I hear people saying, yeah, I'm long this and short this to protect myself. I'm like, you sound like you don't know what you're doing. That's what you're like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's a great question. The commodity markets are completely different from the equity space. Okay. Um, there's, it's an insurance market is really what it is. It, it serves two purposes historically. Uh, one is uh, price discovery. Everybody's looking at the same soybean contract. I think there are four grades of beans that you can deliver against the contract at a premium or a discount, depending on a few factors, including the delivery point. Um, but everyone has a general idea of what the price is, you know what I mean, on any yeah. given moment. And the second thing is, in fact, risk transference, right? So I have risk of the beans in my field. I feel that the prices are high now. Come the end of the crop year, they might be lower, so I can sell them synthetically forward right now, lock in that price. Because what I'm thinking of to answer your question is more about what is my profit margin? I don't have to top tick the market, but I want to run my business. Why? Well, I've got fertilizer, I got labor, I got water, I got lease, leases on my heavy equipment, right? I have seed. Yeah. I might have a lease on the property and or a mortgage. I have labor that I have to pay. So all of that, you know, every month I've got those bills and I have one liquidation revenue event is when I start moving my mm. crop, you see? So what I want to do is make sure that I can run my business. So I sell my crop forward and lock in a price right now to know that I could run my business profitably. When the markets are on a tear and the trends are higher, Yes, if I'm a farmer, I'm probably not going to have my hedges on because the markets are trending higher. But when they reverse, that's when I want to kind of put those on. You know, same thing if I know I need chocolate or sugar or wheat to make the things over at Nestle, uh, which isn't too far from me here, about a half an hour away. Um, I can't let those costs run away from me because you deal with what we call demand elasticity. There's a certain point, like what's the, the biggest cure for high prices is high prices. When gasoline's five bucks a gallon, people are like, I'm not driving anywhere. And then when the demand drops, the prices have to drop for the most part. So there's only so much if I'm Nestle that I, if, if cocoa prices double and chocolate comes from cocoa, um, even the low grade chocolate, right? We're not talking about the high end chocolate, but if chocolate prices double, how much of that cost can I pass on to the consumer before they balk and say, I'm just going to not have cookies for a while? Yeah. Same thing with sugar. So where the hedging comes in is like, we know where our price points are for our brand. Yeah. And if the, you know, typically if price for raw materials goes higher, companies are going to pass those costs off to the end user. But then again, they come up with what's demand elastic, what's demand inelastic. You know, for example, tobacco can probably double as it did and people still buy it because they're addicted, right? Prescription medicine, prices can go higher. People don't really have a choice. But for a lot of other things, if prices go higher, butter becomes too expensive. I'm going to go to veganaise or, <laughs> or, or, or mayonnaise or, or, yeah. or something, some <laughs> vegetable oil-based <laughs> spread that's made with, you know, soybean oil or palm oil and who knows <clears> what. So... So that's where the hedging thing comes in is that it's more about, can I run my company at a profit margin uh, that's, that's healthy for my company so that I could make some money, invest in the company, but also pay all my bills. Um, and it's but tra you know? traders do it too, though. I mean, I get the companies now. Like, I appreciate you explaining that because I didn't understand that until you did that. But, yeah. and, but I thought you were referencing like a trader, a commodity trader who's like trading both. Like they uh -huh. hedge too, right? Is it the same idea? Like, is it just like... I mean, we go back to our fingerprints. There might be somebody else who wants to have a synthetic call. So they buy a put and they go long futures. I think that's a synthetic call. Um, 
And so their, their downside is somewhat hedged. Um, you know, that's not most, I think most people are directional and unhedged. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, Cause insurance costs money, right? Your car insurance, you got to pay a premium. You've got the indemnity, but you got to pay. Same thing, house insurance, any type of insurance, you have to pay a premium. That premium is expenses. It's an expense. The other thing that you can do with futures that that might not make a lot of sense for some of the equity traders out there are what we call spreads, intra yeah. and inter-commodity spreads. If you're an equity guy and you study in or gal or non-binary person, I love everybody. I mean, you study Julian Robertson, he would go long one company, but then he would find the weakest name in that sector and sell it short against it. And that was effectively a hedge. Sometimes they call this pairs trading. So this way, if the market doesn't about face, typically your short position will capture some of that downside sting. There's other guys, uh, I say guys, because these are, are, I'm thinking of guys, I want to mention their name because I don't have their permission to say their name out loud just yet, but um, they might be long specific names, but they notice that the, the, the market has stalled, relative strength might have stalled. So what they'll look to do is take the DIA or the QQQ or the SPY, and they'll actually short the index against their long stock positions to create a bit of a hedge that way. In the commodity space, you're looking at like within soybeans, you might buy one month and then sell a deferred month uh, like an old crop, new crop, because each contract has its own supply and demand and some of them might get more ahead of the, another. This gets kind of complicated to, to talk about without being able to yeah. see it. <laughs> if you're interested in this, you have mm. to study what's called term structure. Um, that would certainly help you. And if you look at any given market, you'll see normally markets are what we call carry charge markets or they're inverted markets. Carry charge is where the cash market is usually the lower price. And then as you go out in the year on the strip, each successive month has a higher price. And so what the market is saying at that moment in time is that even although prices are changing, we have enough supply right now for the demand and we're going to pay you more money to store it and that we, we call those carry charges. When demand gets super tight, those markets flip, and then the cash in the front months become a premium to deferred months, and those markets invert. And there's no upper boundary to how high the market can invert. Hmm. So in other words, the market is saying, supply is tight, give us everything that you can possibly give us right now, we're gonna pay you a very big premium for that. In fact, if you wanna store it, we're gonna pay you less, hence the lower price is there. So, you know, Again, it's hard to to give a lesson on it without being able to see what it looks like. You know, maybe another time, or I'll, I'll send something to your subscribers if you want. But it's a very fascinating market because it that's is. you know markets. You know, companies are run with those raw materials. So when you look at a company, you're kind of like you're looking at almost after the fact of what happens when commodity prices ebb and flow, currencies change. Is that do they get revenue overseas? How do they convert that to dollars? How do they hedge against an adverse move? Um, you know, so there's a lot of moving parts that you can study that go far beyond the fundamentals. I, I want to ask you this, Michael, in, before we start to wrap this up, is there something like this, let's say this, um, this last month for you, uh -huh. how was this last month for you? And did you take away, I don't know if you analyze like this, but if you do, mm -hmm. if you don't just correct it and answer in a different way, but mm -hmm. how was your month last month? And what was your, like, after you reviewed it, were there things that you like say, Hey, I'm going to work on this. And how do you move forward? Like on working on whatever you're trying to work on. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of beyond needing to work on that kind of stuff. You know, my process has been so ingrained from massive repetition. It's like the edge playing new year's day. He doesn't even have to think about it anymore. He knows the song. He knows the chords. It's more of a feeling. So when I look at a chart, I can see where our entries and the, the chart has a feeling unto itself, like it would be a person and a human being. So can I vibe with that chart kind of a mm. deal? And I can, or I can't, um, I don't regret missed opportunities because there's about a million things you could trade Two, You can, you know, living with regrets is like, we don't really have regrets. There's really nothing. The technology is there so that you don't have to miss stuff. I think you might be speaking about, you know, markets frustrating because the breakouts don't really stick, right? They're not, I don't really, 
I don't believe in false breakouts, right? If a breakout happens, it's a breakout. It's not a false breakout, right? So again, I kind of a stickler for language because I want to be hyper vigilant with the story that I tell myself. Like a breakout is a breakout. If it reverses the same day, then you know you have to look at that and pair out of your positions. I think, mm-hmm. um, you know, again, just to give you a real life example, you know, we had American Express and. We had it for a long time and it sold below our stop point. We got stopped. And then several days later, it rallied back and looked, you know, rallied back in our face. It's going to happen to everybody, you know. So do I get frustrated about it? No, because when I when I was in the moment, in the ever evolving moment of right now, I did the best with the information that I had in front of me. I can't make stuff up and say, well, maybe next week something's going to happen. Next week doesn't exist. There is no future. There's only now. So, so, so much of that has been ingrained over the decades for me that, you know, the future doesn't exist. All I have is risk management right now Mm. and hoping or what people are supposed to do, or maybe I'm a week early. That's all narrative that you allow yourself and get to, to have mediocre results. You have to be brutally honest with yourself. And so I don't, I don't have any regrets. I don't feel like I could have done anything better it certainly would have been better if I didn't have to transact as much because once you're in winning trades, you want them to go as long as possible. We had a good run with them. Um, another one, you know, that we were in, that we got knocked out of for the better. Would If, if this is, is this the kind of stuff you, am I answering the question? Yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah. I'm very curious. Cause I, it sounds like you're right. I mean, you're not doing like, we you know, as a day trader or someone who trades, you know, regular every day or is active, mm-hmm. Like no. we may review every month, see what we can improve on, see no. how we can do better. And that's what I was kind of trying to see. But it seems like since you've been training for so long, you're not, you're more so of just constantly focused on the now and not really worried about the previous month. Is that what is, is that what you're saying? Yeah. I mean, I, I can't look at anything different than what the price is today. Yeah. And I talked to my buddy, Brian Shannon, about this quite often about price and like on the street, price is the only thing that's going to tell you the truth. Right now, I can't look and try to interpret fundamentals and say, oh, they're going to show up next week. Or what if this happens? Or what if this happens? Like the best you could do is manage your risk. Yeah. So, you know, we got stopped out of Berkshire Hathaway and it kept going. So does that validate your process or does that validate your feelings or does that validate you as a human being? It really depends who you are. But it was the same as as the American Express. This one kept going down. American Express you know, kind of bounced and rallied back up. What's the answer there to that? To, does it validate you? Does it validate your product? Like what, what's the answer? It's about all about process. That's it. That's it's all about the process. The results are going to come in where they come in and you have to protect your capital. Hmm. And we have, you know, enough size where we don't really stop and think and double, double, you know, maybe I have second thoughts about it. I don't really, I want the thing to keep going. Yes, that's true. Just like someone who's got two years experience, if you're in a trade and it goes and you want the thing to keep going. But right now, the price is working against me. I don't give myself the luxury of daydreaming what life's going to be next week because that's how you get blasted. Mm -hmm. And I mean blasted. And there's no we don't use leverage. So it's it's worse for people who are using leverage. Right. If you're just doing cash on cash. Goodyear tire got stopped and it kept going. Silver, we got stopped and kept going. So. You know, I think you look again, not at any one particular name. You have to look at the process and say, did the process serve me? Did the process serve what the goals are for the people who own the money? Hmm. And the answer to that is yes. Given what you knew at the time, you can second guess yourself on everything. I mean, because you can always look at it tomorrow and be like, oh, I, it, I, I should have known it was in reverse right there. <laughs> There's no chance if you look at that big sell off, I think it was Thursday or Friday of that week. There was no evidence that it was going to snap back. And if you looked at Raven Industries, which I wasn't in, it kind of did the same thing, but earlier, and it was in a downtrend. And then all of a sudden there was a deal. So you can go back and study and say, is there evidence of the deal by looking at volume or price or relative strength? The answer to that question for me is no. Um, Maybe there's people smarter. There probably are, but I cannot infer. Again, so focus on the today, focus on the now. Even if it's frustrating that you're getting 
the frustration that you feel today is a lot better than the despondency that you're going to feel next week when the thing's down another 20 bucks. So that frustration is trying to tell you something that you need to be an adult now and take action Mm. because all you have is the now. Mm. The risk management is happening right now. The future doesn't exist. I don't want to, again, sound like a philosopher because I kind of threw those guys under the bus (laughs) on a little bit, but you really don't have the future. I can't manage future. There's no such thing as future risk management. And, you know, it's, it's awesome that you said that the whole idea of your emotions, like you're using them as signals, right? Like those emotions, 100%. like instead of like it's a fear emotion, like, oh, I shouldn't be scared. No, no, listen to that. The it's marketers like, turn and make it sound like if you're an emotional person or an emotional trader, that somehow you're less than. And that's not the case. I mean, Soros would use as a back, a lower back pain as an early warning system that something's not working for his portfolio. And I talked with Flavia, his coach, who who told me the same thing. So you have to listen to that um, response from your body. Uh, the, your your emotions can be either advocates or they can be antagonists. The marketers mm-hmm. tell you that your emotions are antagonizing you. And maybe for an untrained eye or for someone who thinks that this is an intellectual endeavor, their emotions are going to constantly be at, you know, at them. But ultimately, you can make them your friends if you're just willing to listen. Yep. Yep. Well, well Michael, look, where can people, if they want to ask more questions so we can wrap this up, because I know we've been doing this for about like 40 minutes. I know people are going to be like, hey, let's do it again. So I know we'll probably talk again in the future. Thank you. Where would they uh, be able to reach out to you? Uh, is your website, Twitter? What do you recommend? Yeah, I mean, I use Twitter. I'll just be completely frank with people because it is what it is. I use Twitter for one purpose only, and that's to syndicate the podcast, The Daily Show. Um, if you go to Martin Chronicle, M-A-R-T-I-N-K-R-O-N-I-C-L-E.com, you'll see in the top right corner, there's two things. You can download the audio book or the inner voice of trading for free. And there's also a contact form there. And if someone has a question or something, you know, if I don't, if I don't know the answer, I'll, I'll take the time to point you in the right direction. I'd appreciate not war and peace, write one question as a po- and I don't need the backstory. Just tell me what you're looking for and I'll give you the resources that I have. We're, I also wanna say that we don't really interview people on the show and we don't do guest posts. This way you manage everyone's expectations. The show is really me. It's my five or 10 minutes a day of, of what I'm going through and what I'm thinking about either today or what I went through in the past and how I think the audience might be able to benefit from that wisdom. You know, and I'm, you know, that's it. I'm just trying to help people the best I can. I've been very, very lucky, very fortunate to do what I do to meet the people that I've met the people who have helped me, I'm trying to pay that forward. Um, this is a business that you can do until, you know, you're, you're hundred and something years old. So I still have a long way to go on my own journey. Well, so I, I can help I, other people kick ass and get it done. And, uh, you know, we're all in this together, man. Absolutely. And, and I highly recommend everyone who just heard that to check out his website because, and his podcast, Inner Voice of Trading, because it's a great podcast. How I found Michael myself And I actually reach out to him and he gets back. So he will get back to you. So make sure to reach out to him. If you have any questions at all, his, his podcast is only like five to 10 minutes. And so I like to listen to it while I'm going for a run. I can hear like five, I can hear like three, four, you know, depending on how far I'm running episodes (laughs) and just hear him just talking to me from a different perspective that it's kind of like an older mentor, you know, like the old man's talking to you. (laughs) Exactly. So, so look, Hey, look, man, I, I appreciate you being here again. It's a pleasure. And thanks so much, my man. Yeah. I'm always grateful that anyone, you know, has, has any kind of care about something that I would say. So it's very flattering. Thank you for having me on, you know, you're very, very intelligent person. I know you're doing a good thing for the community too. I would, everyone hit the subscribe button on this show because it's one that's worth watching. Even, even if it's not the one that I'm on, there's a lot of good people here. So thank you for what you do for the community because it all adds up and we need, we need to love and support one another. You know what I mean? We need to help one another. This business is hard. Most people are doing this by themselves. And we need to have this kind of informal community, you know, to help one another. Agreed. Well, thanks again, my man. Take care. Thank you for having me.